Mom, I want to, will you please tell them where you were born and how you happened to live so long in Canada? John wants to know that. Yeah, my dad, I was four years old when we, I was born in, in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And my dad was transferred to Canada when I was four years old. What province of Canada? Saskatchewan. What city? Sask Saskatoon. Okay. So Grandma's got dual citizenship. Oh, I didn't know I that. I did have. Well, yeah, you did. That's right. I did have. And then, in one year, this one year, I think it was about 1939, she has a very interesting story to tell you about singing for the King and Queen of England. Will, oh, you, please oh, tell, wow. will you please tell John that story? Yeah, we had... Um, uh, we had four high schools in Saskatoon, and the girls, we fought. In 1939, the girls. 39. The, the girls formed a, the, all the high schools a chorus. There were. Four, four schools combined? Yeah, the girls. We had girl choirs. No, no boys, but we formed, I've got the picture, uh, of all the girls and a chorus for... Why did, why was the chorus formed? The king and queen of England was or, uh, coming to Saskatoon. So we formed the chorus of all the, oh, I suppose there were uh, 400 girls. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And I've got the picture. My sister-in-law's uncle, and they tore down the old firehouse, and he knew that I had been in this chorus, so he sn snitched <laughs> the picture of all these girls in a chorus. And we held up different colors, so anyway, it formed the chorus. For, as we held up these pieces of cloth, formed the chorus for the king and queen. There were colors, and... Um, Didn't they walk right in front of you? Because you were in the front row. Uh, my girlfriend and I, Ruth, were in the front row. Oh, Is that wow. Ruth Davies? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the king, the king walked right by us, right in front of us. You know, this is a long ago king and queen. Yeah. yeah. Elizabeth had the mother of the current queen. Right. The queen mom. Yeah. Right. The queen mom. Yeah. So the king walked right in front of Ruth, Ruth and I, and. The queen, though, stood on the observation platform, and she waved to us as she walked by. So, and we, she was happy that the <coughs> display, the display that we had, um, and sang, the, of course, sang the uh, national anthem. God save, I would imagine you saying God save the queen. Yeah. Because they all were, or, well, no, he was the king, so there was a king, so I don't know what they sang for the king, because with, if it's a queen, it's God save the queen. Right. So she's got a picture, a very long picture, this big, that shows these you, 400 yeah. girls who sang big event wow. for the king. Now, Mary never realized it, but she had a beautiful soprano voice. The problem is she was not interested in it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if she had wanted to pursue voice, so she, now we're, she had a natural, beautiful voice. So now, but Grandma had, you, you had your brother John 
and Lester, right? Lester, yeah. And they were they were much older than you, right? Oh yeah. Sixteen years. Sixteen Lester years. Lester was sixteen years older, and John was fifteen years older. And so, so were your parents born in the states? Yes, Iowa. Yeah. Oh yeah, in Iowa. And then your dad was with what? The, wasn't it the Pacific C Northwest? CPR. CPR. Yeah. You just asked a very interesting question. It just happens that her ancestors, well, obviously, everybody started in the East. Mm -hmm. So this one year, we followed them. There's a little university in the state of New York called Alfred University. Mm -hmm. It's a state school. It's noted for ceramics. Mm -hmm. We went there, and we <laughs> went to trace her forebears being at that school. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, they had this book, went to the library, this small book, had the various years of attendees, and there he was. What's his name, Mary? McHenry. McHenry. Yeah. And uh, he got an engineering degree. Now, they reached the same point as my grand our grandfather. They wanted to move west for the opportunity and land. And they settled in Iowa. And the, when he landed in Iowa, he walked something like 60 miles, because there was no transportation. Uh, uh, Denison. They had no transportation then. He did the surveying for the entire county, and they ended up being good, solid, important people in Iowa. And that's where her parents are both Iowa people. And her mother, her mother inherited this beautiful farm. And unfortunately, who took it away from her, Mary? Well, her, her mother died and uh, mother, my mother inherited the farm. Yeah. And so Grandpa married again, and his wife was a real bitch, <laughs> <laughs> and she she took all the got all the money that my mother in, inherited. Her mother suffered a very serious financial setback, lost the farm. They literally stole it from her. <laughs> she wasn't wise enough in the world of business. To protect well, she didn't have anybody to, to stand up for her, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. wow. Anyway, we, so we checked, they, they were originally, there's a county in Pennsylvania called Wyoming County. You would know that. Susquehanna. Uh-huh. They migrated from there up into New York State by river, the river, Susquehanna. Yeah. And you know, like tug, tug rafts. Mm -hmm. In fact, sadly, the mother broke her leg in that incident. But they they migrated to New York State, where believe it or not, there's a place called McHenry Valley. Valley. So we went to this little township building. And he says, "Yes, McHenry Valley's right out here. You're practically on." We traced her ancestors, as well as mine. Of course, my grandfather, being a soldier, he's all, we went to Albany, the capital, to study his military records. Mm -hmm. We've got that. But uh, we, we had the pleasure. And then there's a little town called... <laughs> yeah, go on. Who's the famous bitch actress in Hollywood? She just did making a movie. Fonda. Fonda. There's a little, <laughs> there's a little, very small town of Fonda. And 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 we're going now, from the name McHenry to the name Williams, which she was. Mm -hmm. Her father. Her she's a Williams. Mm -hmm. Maybe and in this little John Williams, <laughs> like a Moser. Maybe. And in this little town, they have these little things. What do you call them where you can get a 
whole lot of data, uh, and put them in a machine. Uh, a thumb drive? What? For your computer, like a little... No, computer, before a computer. Oh. Talking about... Microfish? What? Microfish? Microfish? Yeah. Yeah. And they have one of the largest in this little town, one of the largest of history, people history. And we went there and we were talking to this gal and she said, we're, what was his name, John Williams? No, what was, no. he wasn't John, was he? No. Anyway, she said, yeah, I'll show you his house. He was an officer of the town, like treasurer. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I lived in that house. And you, if you want to see it, you better go now because the so then we went. Then we went. Then, then we went to the cemetery to see his grave marker. Couldn't find it. We found out why. Kids from the school, which is next door, had pushed over the grave marker, oh, so it was lying flat instead of erect. Okay. <laughs> now we've so we have traced the Williams, and she, uh, uh, John. Our son John inherited the beautiful ebony gold cane that he got when he retired as a town officer. Mm. John got the gold well respected. cane. But the Williams also decided to do the same thing and move west. Therefore, they were living in St. Paul, Minnesota when Mary was born. Now, I, we don't have the history between New York and, and Minnesota. I'm sorry, we don't have it. But at the same time, we're tracing the Williams, the McHenrys, the Curry. They're all all Eastern people. Mm, wow. People did, say... Did you, weren't some of your relatives named Faust? Oh, that was... Yeah, that was... Uh... Uh, let me think. Was that from your mom's side? Yeah, that was from Williams. That was, yeah, because I know you one yeah. time said something in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, there were a bunch of Fausts that were related to you. Yeah. Well, anyway, they got, they got to the West, and now, we, we're, now we're in Iowa. We're continuing this quest, and there's a beautiful museum, a, a, a huge house converted to a museum and we found a relative that was in uh, Denison yeah right. Denison Iowa and we wanted to go to the museum and unfortunately it was locked but the guy that ran the museum was a postman he only did this part-time and thank God he came off his route about three in the afternoon he gave us a personal tour of that museum, the McHenry Museum, mm -hmm. which was another happy, blessing, blessed consequence. And so we're doing all this research, and uh, and we've now gotten to Iowa, where they all migrated to, as I said before. And. Uh, uh, her father became, he was in the, in the real estate business having to do with migration. Out of St. Paul, he was taking trainloads of people to Florida to buy land. Yeah, that's too bad. My dad didn't buy some because it was where Disney world is now. Oh, really? Yeah. Probably, probably $10 an acre, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, he didn't, he also did the same thing in Oregon, train loads of people. They had to pay their way. Yeah, but Ruth's, Ruth's father-in-law, he, he hated the, the migration because they migrated to where his, he showed land where his father <laughs> lived. Yeah. Well, uh, so mom, so your your maiden name, your mom's maiden, your maiden name is Williams, and your mom was McHenry. 
McHenry. Right. And and then what was your your dad? Uh, yeah. On the dad's side, it's Williams. Williams, that's right. So we're 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 chasing down Williams, McHenry. Now we're in Iowa. Her dad worked in the industry, as I said. Uh, you must understand, in those days, large parts of the United States were not occupied. Mm -hmm. They were ready to be occupied. Somebody had to buy them. The railroads needed that to guarantee their existence. Sure. So he was doing that work. And in the process of doing that, he became employed by the Canadian Pacific Railway not in engines, not in cars, in immigration. They had a special department. They took people from, mostly from Eastern Europe, across the ocean on their ship, Canadian Pacific, landed them in New York, and her father would get a phone call or a telegram, you got 50 people coming from Kiev, that need a place to live and work. Wow. And of course, Saskatchewan is largely agricultural, so these poor, I mean penny poor immigrants landed on farms, working for maybe a dollar a week. I mean, they were poor. And then when they saved enough money, they brought their families over. And now today's those Descendants of those people are all millionaires. They own farms, 20,000 acres, 50,000 acres, where they grow wheat. It's flat land until you reach the mountains of Canadian, Canadian Rocky. So that was his interesting job. And then, then, world, then the Great Depression came on, and these poor people, who were no longer that poor, bought their farms, and they borrowed the money from life insurance companies. You know, uh, life insurance companies cannot invest in stocks and bonds. They have to be more stable, because death is a certainty. Mm -hmm. And he changed, the company then formed another division that had to do with the financing of farms that were in, now in foreclosure. Mm. And the, the companies that, that owned the money obviously did not want to own farms. So they gave very liberal terms for them to pay back, pay the money to re remove the foreclosure. And his job was to contact those many hundreds of people and make sure that she was, they were not diverting that money it was something other than paying off the loan. Sure, okay. And that was another, what was that called, Mary? What was that financial company? CCA. Yeah. Canadian, I can. CCA, Canadian something, also a branch of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Mm -hmm. So he spent his life in immigration, which means a very interesting job. Yeah. He had to help them. And when he would travel around and see their poverty, he would carry fruit like oranges or bananas. The poor kids had never seen a banana. They'd never seen an orange. Mm -hmm. He'd give them fruit. He felt so they damn sorry. Look at the little kids who start to eat a banana, skin and all, you know. They, they never didn't seen know what to do. They had never seen a banana. Uh -huh. So he did that and he retired finally from and he had an office in Saskatoon to handle this immigration thing. They settled thousands of people who, I repeat, became wealthy. Mm -hmm. They don't live up there in the wintertime. They go to Arizona. Sure. It's bitterly cold up there. Mm -hmm. And they've got the millions to do it. So that's the history, briefly stated, of Mary's family. Now her brother, uh, she had a, life was brutally real during the Depression. Mm -hmm. Her one, she, they had a nice house in Saskatoon, 219th Street. 
Street. How I remember that. 219 9th uh-huh. Street. And she had her own bedroom. Very happy. School. Her one brother, who married a woman not very much liked by the whole family, <laughs> he lost his job. I'm giving well, you. But he was. He was. They were living in St. Paul. Yeah, he lost his job in the depression, like thousands of people did. Of course. So what does he do? He comes back to live with his parents. They took her bedroom. <laughs> she has never recovered from that. It's caused her to have a lifetime of regret. They took her bedroom. She had to sleep in her parents' bedroom on a cot. Mm-hmm. Well, can you imagine being 10 years old, someone stealing your bedroom? Yeah, that would be pretty unsettling. Psychologically, it was, yeah. it, it was a terrible, terrible event for Mary. And I've always felt so sorry for her. Well, eventually, of course, they eventually got a job as their depression ended, the 30s, and uh, uh, they moved out, of course, and she got her bedroom back and lived there till high school, you know, getting out of school. And uh, this one year, since he worked for the railroad, they got free tickets, which were called passes, to travel anywhere in the United States and Canada by rail, including American train. They just, uh, her grandfather had, had, had left Iowa, gone to California. This is another movement that her part of her family did. McHenry, right? No. Williams? Yeah. William, oh, I got the wrong, okay. So William, he was living, her grandfather, her dad said to them, her mother, her, if you want to see your grandparents, you want to see your relative, you better do it now because they're not going to be around forever. Well, so, you're not going to be able to get passes yeah. on the railroad. So he got them a whole raft of free passes they traveled westward in Canada to Victoria, the, the, the westernmost British Columbia. They traveled down the British coast to, through Washington, Oregon. They went, when they were in Oregon, they went to the temple of the, what, what do you call them? No, Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, they went to the temple that you can visit. Oh, for the Mormon? Mormon. Yeah, yeah for the Mormon and tabernacle. We talked to a man and, and he gave us a tour. Oh, did he? Of the uh, Mormon temple. temple. Yeah. yeah. Then the they temple. traveled down to California to meet with her grandfather. Well, we had we started off in Saskatoon and we had 14 passes, free passes on the wow. railroads. They spent the they fun. spent the time in California visiting. Grandpa. And I don't remember you ever saying anything that you remember being interesting in that visit. Yeah. What what? Oh, I, we went stayed at Grandpa's quite a while. I know, but that's not an incident. That's not an episode. Did you go to museums or do anything? Yeah. Not a heck of a lot, though. No, they didn't. Traveling because it was just had... mostly to see people. Well, then they started east. They have relatives in Colorado, so they stopped in Colorado. Then they traveled to Iowa, where where they all started from, visited the old home place, and from, and it happened that a couple that they knew very well in Iowa, the couple traveled to Watertown, South Dakota to take a banking job. And that was where I met so, Waterloo. So they went from Iowa <laughs> up to Watertown, South Dakota to visit these people whom they knew back from Iowa. And one day mom got a call 
say, we've got a young girl here. Is there any way Ken and Bob could maybe entertain her while she's here? We said, sure. And then I'm going to have Mary tell you the story because it's really shameful what I did. Oh, here we go. Mary, tell them. <laughs> well, see, that friend of my mother's um, arranged to, she wanted the boy, the Carey boys, to entertain me while I was in Watertown. And you were at that time young and beautiful like you are now, yeah. but she was very attractive. Tell them the story. I'm ashamed. So Elsie, I'm ashamed of it. Elsie had arranged it for me to have my hair done, and she was all hip for me to meet the Carey boys. So <laughs> he, she arranged to have Bob, his brother, take me golfing, which which they did, but. They came and picked me up, or Bob did, Ken's brother. You understand why I'm ashamed of that? That's <laughs> shameful. Because he stole I your didn't brother's. Want, I, I, okay. I didn't want a blind date with some old bag. <laughs> and he, he called back and said, yeah, Ken, she's a nice looking girl. You'll enjoy it. So we went out and played golf. <laughs> you sent your brother ahead of you to... Yeah, I, that's not a... To, <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't tell you that story if it weren't true, because I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> it's one thing in my life I'm very ashamed of. It means you were very particular. <laughs> well, I never had yeah. a blind date in my life. Yeah. You're doing your and research. I had, a, I had a girlfriend. He I didn't had need, a I didn't need girl Oh, you had a girlfriend at the time. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, what happened to her? Well, I didn't, you know, I couldn't. She died with about. a broken heart. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's how we met, and became in love, zip quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was five eight, one hundred and twenty five, one hundred twenty pound, beautiful. She wore. I even remember the skirt she wore. She wore a checkered skirt, and I never forgot that beautiful skirt. <laughs> so uh, then she had to go back to Canada. And we ostensibly wanted to keep our relationship going. But unfortunately, there was a period of time when she had a kidney problem. Never had it since. And our relationship stopped. No, well, I quit writing, do you? <laughs> and, and, uh, Old. and then one day, uh, Elsie, the, the lady, the, the mutual friend in Watertown, uh, wrote... That was many years later. Yeah, that was not many, three or four years later, that either you or I was interested, wondering what the other person was doing. I, I can't remember what... Well, Elsie, I, we hadn't written for, to one another. I quit writing to you. Yeah, and then Elsie... And then Elsie, years later, she said, Oh, poor Kenneth is in the, uh, has enlisted in the service, and he's stationed down in Georgia. So why don't you write to him again? So I wrote him a very... <laughs> letter and we ended up right into it. He got it. I got a airmail special delivery letter from him. <laughs> mm -hmm. We ended up writing to each other every day. Wow. And I still got I still got the letters. Yeah, I know you do. You got <laughs> I'd like to see trail. those. Yeah, they have them over the trillion. No, the, they said that nobody's allowed to look at them. And they're the not. A, no, all right. I'm sorry, they're not available for any kind of scrutiny. No oh, way. That's all right. <laughs> no way. Uh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do nothing but laugh like hell. <laughs> anyway, so we arranged. I, I got a furlough. That's the Army way of saying vacation. I got a furlough. She got 
uh, uh, the tickets to come so we could meet again, mm -hmm. Watertown. And immediately, the old, the old immediate flare. I mean, I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll never forget when she came in the back door. <laughs> she said, oh, Ken. And it was such a wonderful <coughs> voice. Wonderful voice. We got married in, what, eight days? Less than that. You got home on the 12th, and we were married on the 19th. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Seven days. And Mom, my mother seriously said, your dad wanted to get married when he was in the military, and I insisted you had to get out of the military before I married. She didn't want us to get married until I got out of the military, which is not nonsensical. Yeah. Makes some, but I said, Mom, this is only this is one decision that I make, like I did, grandiose, big, uh, and if I don't make it now, I might not ever. Mm -hmm. I want to get married. I'm at that time in life. I want to have a wife, <laughs> and I want to marry Mary. And we got married. Now, wow. what's you, you young people today? Don't realize the inconveniences the war brings about. There was not one friend of mine at the wedding. Not one. They're all in the military. Mm. And I'm sorry to say, several of them died. One of them, George Kausch, who's killed in a bomber, crashed in Europe. Bill Goodall got killed. The only people at the wedding were old people. Mm -hmm. My, my cousin was best man. He was at that time about 35, 40 years old. <clears throat> so what? No gifts? You couldn't buy a wedding gift. Nothing was available in World War II. You couldn't buy anything. Yeah. And uh, the only thing that they did up in Canada, they did give us a set. Her friends gave a, a set of that Spoed China, which was available. That expensive stuff, which nobody uses. Is we that, never use. Is used. that the one that you're talking about? Somebody has the Spode China? That, that's, oh, okay, I didn't realize the connection there. And then, yeah. I, and I, I even remember the name of the pattern. Billingsley Rose. Oh, Billingsley Rose? <laughs> that's the pattern that's set in the closet. But uh, then we had to go back after the war to go back to my job in Cleveland. And she's she's living in Fort Wayne, obviously. No, I was I was in Cleveland. Honey, you were in Fort Wayne. Okay. Well, I thought she went back to live with her parents yeah. at some yeah. point where you were in the service. Yeah, but that's long time before this. Oh, okay. This is now I'm in the military, and we finally did live together. Oh, yeah, you were married. Okay, yeah, that's right. We finally, after one year, first time, they had a government housing project in Fort Wayne for soldiers and people who worked at the base. And we got our name picked, never so happy in our lives, and that's where we live. I think it cost $35 a month rent. And it was heaven. Mm -hmm. Heaven! Linda was a baby, we had a baby buggy. We had no car. We used the baby buggy to carry groceries. <laughs> we had to buy groceries. Well, anyway, we worked through that period. Now we got to get back to work, my job. So she's still living in Fort Wayne. I traveled weekends on a train from there's a railroad called Nickel Plate. It had a convenient train going from Cleveland to Fort Wayne. I did it on weekends. And then I had to get a place in Cleveland. Couldn't find anything, and so we his, shared. His, his sister came to live with us. Mm -hmm. in, in Fort Wayne. The poor girl needed a lot of guidance. Well, she got a job, and she met her husband because of us, the fact that she could come and live with us. We didn't have, much, we didn't have a space enough for two people, but, but we had was, to make space for three people. She was just coming for a visit. Well, we didn't know it, 
that she was already planning on coming and living, living with us. Oh, wow. And she did get a job, and it worked out fine. But for a while, you know, we were super crowded. <clears throat> well, then in Cleveland, we made a connection with a widow lady who had this two-family house in Lakewood, real nice neighborhood, new, real nice house. We shared quarters with her and her daughter. And That's I, all we could I do. Was right. the, I was the maid. Boy, so mom ended up being... Mom ended up being the cook and the housemaid, which was not exactly wonderful for mom. I would then. Yeah. I was well, yeah, amazed. especially especially because didn't you didn't you tell me once your when you traveled with your dad, you guys were pretty high end. <laughs> yeah. Now from that point, we entered our name in a lottery. They built a small two lane housing complex on the absolute edge of the Cleveland airport, fortunately near Berea, which is a wonderful little town. Our name was picked by the grace of God, so we moved first housing we had of our own to live together. And John was born there, Linda was there, of course. Linda was born in Canada with her folks home. And we had a pot belly <laughs> stove for heat. Very dangerous. But we were in heaven. And I took the bus to work downtown Cleveland. I took the bus to work at home at night, read the paper on the way home. And then, of course, progress has us we had to get a big, we had to get a house. Mm -hmm. We had to buy a house. Yeah. So we found this builder in North Homestead. He was building houses on both sides of a rather, not a real long street, perhaps 10 houses. And we entered into a contract for $9,500 to buy this house. I gave him $500 earnest money and we had a terrific problem with it because the Korean War broke out. Real estate prices went up 10% overnight. He was so sorry he had sold before the price. So he asked us to increase our earnest money by another 500 bucks. Mm. And I talked to my friends down at the office, many of whom are lawyers, and he said, Ken, you're not only not going to get that house, you're also going to lose your money. Oh, jeez. Nice news, huh? Yeah. Well, that made me more and more determined to stick with it. And we went to his house in Lakewood, and I argued. We shouted at each other. <laughs> and at the end, I made the best decision financially that I've ever made. I agreed to pay it. Why? Number one, I had to have a house. I, sure, suing, what, 12? 15 months later, yeah, and I'm, I don't have a house. No way. So I agreed, and it was a terribly, it was a terribly correct decision to agree to pay him, tore up the original sales thing. We had a written contract, put down 1,000 instead of 500, paid it to him, and we got the house. Mm -hmm. Wonderful decision. Very happy. Lucille Drive in North Olmstead. We landscape it, and then we needed more room. We built a second house in North Homestead, and that was quite uneventful. A beautiful ranch house with almost one acre of land. And uh, John started playing football. John was just barely getting into high school. And then later on, I made the decision to come, come to Columbus, where we are now. Mm -hmm. That's our history. World War II history, where we were very lucky, and we came to Columbus, and I, I, she didn't make any of these decisions, I made all of them. I made the decision where to, buy, where to build a house. It wasn't a very difficult decision. Across the street from the high school, walking distance to everything, including church, pool, 
and we built a five bedroom house. I don't you I'm sure you remember that. Yeah. Is it the same house that you yeah. guys were most recently? Fifty one. We wow. lived in lived in it fifty one years. It's incredible. And a very happy, terribly, terribly important decision I made to to for the kids in that wonderful community of Worthington. Just and I'm not bragging. I say it's dumb luck and blessings. I made all the right decisions yeah. without trying. That's great. You're I, smart about it. And we happened to pick two young brothers that were 29 years old, twin brothers. Their name was Butts, B-U-T-T-S. Wonderful boys. Had no problems building the house, which can be a real source of problems. Mm -hmm. We moved in. I had uh, absolutely didn't have the money to paint it, so I did all the interior decoration. All it took me six months, working till midnight, painting, which I don't mind doing, incidentally. Mm -hmm. So it was just a little bit of a hardship. Right. And everything went along. We organized the band. Uh, uh, my partners. Well, first of all, I was very active with the independent insurance agents of Ohio, where I had the pleasure of working with all agents from all over the state. And the year that we went up to Canada, the, the, the man that ran the association told Mary they were giving me the annual John Paul Revere Award. Don't tell Ken. And we're in Canada, we got a telegram. Mary knew it was coming, I didn't. They gave me this war, this plaque, for the, they each do it once, he, one person is selected per year. I don't think I earned it, truthfully, but I did a lot of work. But they were in Switzerland. They were having a convention in Switzerland. And of course, we couldn't afford to go. But um, they told me that Ken was going to get the award, mm -hmm. but don't tell him. So we're in the hotel in, in uh, Saskatoon when the telegram came. Mm -hmm. that, and he I, was getting a, that he was getting it. And it was, a, you know, I never even, I never even considered the possibility of getting it. I didn't want it, really. You know, I didn't think I qualified. You're just doing your job. I, I didn't qualify. And, but just like, just like with Robert Shaw, I did. It took guts for yeah. me to audition 